This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman, with Juan Gonzalez. We end today's show with journalist Alyssa Cord, executive director of the Economic Hardship Reporting Project, where she worked closely for years with the late Barbara Ehrenreich. Her new book is called Bootstrapped, Liberating Ourselves from the American Dream. In it, she critically examines the American narrative of self-reliance that emphasizes success as a result of individual hard work. The myth shapes our policies as portrayed in popular culture, including the the Horatio Alger stories, Ayn Rand's books, Atlas Shrugged and The Fountainhead, and television shows, like in the Reagan-era series Little House on the Prairie, about a family's life on the American frontier. <laughs> That's the theme music for Little House on the Prairie. You know, Alyssa Court, welcome back to Democracy Now! You write in your preface to Bootstrapped, quote, I receive messages from strangers about how the poor are responsible for their own poverty on a routine basis. Those who are economically on the edge, they write, just need to pull themselves up by their bootstraps. Um, can you lay out what this means as the granddaughter of um, a couple who owned a shoe store in the Bronx, why you think a bootstrap is key to understanding the false narrative that is developed in this country? Yeah, so what I see, I run this organization that Barbara Ehrenreich and I created, Economic Hardship Reporting Project, and we get these—we got these letters and comments that would be sort of blaming our writers for the uh, poverty they experienced and the difficulties they experienced. And I wanted to get the bottom of it. What was this about? And the more I looked into it, it seemed like it was just this story of shame and blame that has followed people who struggle in this country since the 19th century. And I, I really—I I see it in the early writings of people like Horatio Alger, et cetera. About Horatio Alger in particular, you really go into him in the book. <laughs> yes. I mean, Horatio Alger wrote over a hundred novels, and they were all these stories of these young men. They have names like Tony the Tramp or Ragged Dick. And they were very young, I mean, teenagers. And when you look at the stories, though, supposedly the Horatio Alger story is about luck and pluck, about a young man through hard work making it in America, coming from nothing. In truth, he always meets an older gentleman who is rich, who uh, saves him, basically, and makes him into a success story. Horatio Alger himself uh, was a committed pedophilic acts, had been a minister, had been chased out of the church in Massachusetts. And I think we need to look at these stories, we need to look at the people who created them, um, to see some of the hypocrisy and also the complexity. You know, these, these young men were not doing this, the teenagers were not making themselves into success stories from nothing by themselves. They had the help of wealthy elder people. And that's really how things work in this country. And the, the title bootstrapped, it, it struck me, uh, uh, Alyssa, because uh, Pu Puerto Rico in the 1940s and 1950s adopted an industrial and economic policy called Operation Bootstrap. It was supposedly the island was going to lift itself out of poverty. Uh, and uh, of course, the reality was that the method used tax exemptions, federal tax exemptions, local tax exemptions uh, to lure country uh, companies to come to Puerto Rico to set up shop. So it really was not uh, a, a country lifting itself up. It was using the tax system uh, to benefit corporations that would then help lift the island up. This whole idea of the, the bootstrap, you talk in your book about how the concept even originally began. Yeah, so that's a great point that that example from Puerto Rico, I mean, the concept of bootstrapping is an impossibility. You cannot pull on—you can barely pull yourself—pull your boots on by your bootstraps. You certainly can't pull yourself up by your bootstraps. And it started out, actually, in 1834 as a joke. It was a phrase, an absurdity, that somehow became uh, something to aspire to over the decades that passed. And I think we need to remember it's still an absurdity. Nobody is able to do this alone. You need infrastructure. You need a tax base. 
You need parents. You need schools. And this is the message that I'm hoping we'll get through from this book. And it's also a message that has to do with the pandemic. It's things we learned during the pandemic about relying on each other and surviving with the help of others. I'd like to ask you also about something that is bandied about a lot these days in Congress and in terms of dealing with financial problems of the country, the word entitlements for use for referring to Social Security, for example. Could you talk about that? Yeah, I mean, I think even the word entitlement and part of what I'm doing in this book is looking at the language that people use to demonize people who are financially struggling, this kind of idea of the undeserving poor and the, the opposite, the deserving rich. So, I mean, if we look at what just happened at Silicon Valley Bank and other banks that have just gotten a bailout, they've gotten entitlements on a massive scale, and yet they're not being shamed and blamed for it, like people who are kicked off of welfare rolls or have to recertify for SNAP on a constant basis. And I think we need to look at the double standard that we have for people who are at the, the top of the pyramid economically and those towards the bottom. So, Alyssa Cord, I want to follow up on that. Um, as uh, the debt um, uh, is going to be negotiated, the whole debt ceiling and the question, really, of the, these programs uh, being put on the table. You go back in time. And I think your story about Ayn Rand, right, who at the Fountainhead, Atlas Shrugged, uh, uh, worshipped by Alan Greenspan and so many others, um, the story of Ayn Rand herself and what she relied on and how these programs uh, for her were essential at the end of her life. Yeah, at the end of her life, Ayn Rand, who's this technology—I mean, it makes—it's great Silicon Valley bank. It's the perfect segue, because, you know, a lot of these technologists worship her. I think some of them have, like, boats named after the Fountainhead and uh, kind of books that Ayn Rand wrote. But in truth, at the end of her life, she was dependent on Medicare and Social Security. She had had lung cancer. And she used a proxy, uh, like sort of a friend uh, or assistant, to get, the, get that, those services for her. But they were in her name. And this is somebody who said, oh, I'm, I'm on my, you know, you have to survive on your own, you know, everybody has to accrue as much power as they possibly can, and that's the only thing that matters. And at the end, like so many of us, uh, she was dependent. She was dependent on her, her acquaintances, nurses, and ultimately the state. And I think we need to remember that. Uh, you, you wrote a New York Times piece headlined, Can We Put an End to America's Most Dangerous Myth? And in it, you cite a 2020 a Pew study, which found that 60 percent of Republicans say personal choices are one of the main contributors uh, to economic inequality. What, what do you think accounts for this belief? But I think there's something called loss aversion, where you have people who are— um, sort of in the middle class, let's say. I mean, a lot of the Trump supporters, if we look back at the, their earnings, they, they earned like something like an uh, average of $71,000 a year. These were not poor people. But they were afraid of falling down the ladder. And I think that uh, that's something that means that they put too much value almost in the power of their own hard work and determination to protect them from falling down the ladder. They sort of use it almost as a kind of magical thinking. And so I think th that's re reflected in that study. I think what's so really interesting about your book, uh, Bootstrapped, is the way you look at popular culture, whether we're talking about Ayn Rand and, as you said, like ends up uh, on Social Security and using Medicare and needs that, uh, but we think about her as the person who is completely separate from anything like that, to Little House on the Prairie that shaped so much of um, the 1980s in popular culture. Talk about the Homestead Act. Talk about what shaped this country, what people relied on, but then what they deny uh, once they rise to the top. Yeah. So, I, Homestead Act of 1862 was is the biggest to, to date land giveaway that this country has ever seen. And anytime you see these stories about pioneers, including Little House on the Prairie, there's a great likelihood that they received a parcel of land um, from the U.S. government, and that was what led to their you know, uh, their farming and their, their future success, their, their property holding. Of course, this land was originally—let's just 
be frank, stolen from indigenous people. Majority of the people who received it were white. Um, many were, were men. And that is the story that, that begins this country as, you know, the, the, the West, the settling of the West. And in Little House on the Prairie, in this kind of popular culture, we're just seeing the rugged individualism. We're not seeing the social generosity at the root of it. So when I'm trying to myth bust in this book, I'm trying to I keep trying to point out the spaces where people had a hand, a hand out and a hand up that they may be denying, because I think that's part of what we need to do. We need to start critiquing the self-made myth um, in politics, in a contemporary politics, and also historically. And we have to go back in the past to get to the future. So we have to look at things like the Homestead Act, and we have to look at things like the GI Bill, that were real acts of uh, social giving that have helped people survive. And we need to use them rhetorically when we're, we're asking for more support for our, our, our citizens. Over the years, Donald Trump has repeatedly portrayed himself as a self-made billionaire whose only head start was a small loan of a million dollars from his father. It's not been easy for me. It has not been easy for me. And, you know, I, I started off in Brooklyn. My father gave me a small loan of a million dollars. I came into Manhattan. And I had to pay him back, and I had to pay him back with interest. I built what I built myself. And I did it by working long hours and working hard and working smart. More importantly than anything else is by using my own brain. And there was a point where I was making so much so fast and it was so easy that I almost got bored. And it's true. In a chapter on rich fictions, Alyssa, you write about how Trump has pushed the myth that he's a self-made man and spoke to voters who said this was key to their support for him. Yeah, there was a study done in, I think, Wisconsin in uh, 2018 that talked to Republican and Republican-leaning voters as they were, you know, deciding in, in, I think, even in the voting, you know, voting polling stations, like, who they were going to vote for. And they, they thought he was self-made, and that, that was part of why they said they were voting for him. And when the researchers kind of laid out the ways that he was not self-made, their— uh, their ardor to vote for him went down by 10 percent. I thought it was a fascinating study, and it was something that potentially progressives and Democrats should be thinking about uh, when they're trying to, you know, when they're up against somebody who, in Trump's case, falsely portrays himself as self-made, obviously beneficiary of Fred Trump um, and millions of dollars and loans and all the rest and, you know, uh, not paying his taxes, um, that once we show people this, that it can actually be a tool for social change. And we need to sort of puncture the myth uh, whenever it crops up. And uh, this uh, fixation with the individual effort as, as uh, determining your success or not, how did that uh uh, how did that fare during the pandemic uh, and uh, the enormous sense that people had uh, to that they needed help in dealing with the pandemic? I, I feel like the pandemic taught us a lot of lessons around the value of what I call the art of dependence, the grace and skill and um, power of depending on other people in our lives, which we, we all do on some level. But during the pandemic, we were dependent on people to, you know, so-called curbside delivery, which were people. People were curbside delivery, right? They, um, we were dependent on our medical system on a grand scale. We were dependent on our uh, the parents of our children's friends to do remote schooling if we were do, doing remote schooling with them in so-called pods, which people wound up hating. But, um, the point being that it was a moment where we recognized how interlocked we were, um, how complementary. I think there were there was, we were valuing essential work. We called low wage workers, essential workers, frontline workers, not unskilled, which is a term I really dislike for talking about uh, people who do a good day's job. If anyone's ever made a pizza, you know a guy making a pizza is not unskilled. That that we respected those folks. We gave them uh, sometimes hazard pay. I think the pandemic had lessons for us about valuing each other and valuing a certain kind of worker or maybe sometimes a little, uh, you know, uh, in a way that didn't wasn't sustainable for people, unfortunately. But we, we need to get back there and to remember the, the sort of value of those those moments of togetherness and interlockingness. Alyssa Corr, we want to thank you for being with us, executive director of the Economic Hardship Reporting Project, her new book. 
bootstrapped, liberating ourselves from the American dream. That does it for our show. Democracy Now! is currently accepting applications for a digital fellow. Learn more and apply at democracynow.org. Democracy Now! is produced with Mike Berker, Nick Feldstein, the Gesner, Messiah Rhodes, Nermeen Sheikh, Maria Tarasena, Tammy Warren, Octorina Nadura, Sam Alcoff, Tay Maria Studio, John Hamilton, Robbie Karen, Honey Masood, Sanji Lopez. I'm Amy Goodman with Juan Gonzalez.